Cool. So my name is Yusuke, um, and this is a talk about some of the lessons we learned in testing a giant uh, Python code base. So um, as mentioned, you can totally follow along um, with the slides here. I actually recommend it a little bit because the code snippets I'm going to post tend to be fairly verbose and um, unfortunately a little bit complex. So uh, it might be good to just have that available to flip back if I'm just flipping too forward too quickly. Okay, so let's talk about this Hydra. Um, what's going on with that? It's uh, effectively I'm talking about at Zillow. Um, where I work, we have an in-house monitoring and full-stack testing framework. It's responsible for basically any possible testing outside of unit testing at Zillow, and it has a lot of functionality, like test analysis, result logging, supporting a very different various different kinds of drivers and testing. Um, and as a result of that, it is our largest Python code base um, at Zillow. It clocks in at roughly 60,000 lines of code um, in a single repository. Um, and the best part was it was ownerless for a very long time. It was uh, a few people's Hack Week project. They wanted to work on that. And afterwards, it tended to work OK, so it was in this kind of weird maintenance mode. I think everyone's been there at some point or another. So what does it mean to kind of be ownerless? Well, it means a lack of strong leadership. Um, and what does that mean? Well, when someone comes in there and wants to make a change, they kind of just go where they want to, they patch it, and they move on. Right? This growth is a lot more organic rather than directed. Um, so I was trying to look for a good example of what organic growth looks like. And I think this is the best diagram I could find, right? Under the hood there, you could some, almost see the original vision that someone had. But if you're someone who's just trying to go in there, make a change, you're just going to kind of find the place where you can, patch those cores, and move on. So after enough of this, we decided it was time for centralized ownership. So we got serious about it. We put a team behind it. I'm on that team. Um, and one of the first things we did is we took a step back, looked at that code base, we tried to do some changes to it, and we've identified some major problems, right? Some to, that keep us from really making changes quickly. And one of them was just the tests. Um, the tests were really difficult to maintain. They were complex, they were brittle, causing problems all the time. One feature change would break hundreds of unit tests. Um, and this talk really is about the lessons we learned in trying to improve that. So we're going to talk a lot about the patterns that we learned and um, about the fun times we spent cleaning this infrastructure up. Cool. So um, before we kind of move on further, I wanted to just standardize on some terminology. Um, I know some of this stuff might be common, some of this stuff might not. But um, just from top down, um, I have a definition for a fixture. A fixture is basically, it could be a Python dictionary, it could be a class or an object. It's basically anything that represents some, some data that will help your unit test validate the behavior, right? Um, but beyond that, we have this concept of a mock. A mock is a kind of fixture, um, but a mock is a lot more freeform versus you know, an actual object that you're instantiating. It kind of adjusts to whatever sort of input you want to pass it. It'll let you do whatever calls on it. It'll kind of tell you how those calls worked, um, and you can sort of assert how it was, how it was called. Um, so that's a mock, and then a patch is a specific use or sort of set of functionality around a mock where you take any sort of import path in the Python library um, and you can replace that particular object with a mock. Um, so in this particular example, you could imagine that this get user gravatar functionality calls requests under the hood to sort of mock that request out. I use mock.patch, um, and I basically mock out request.get, and I just make sure that gets called. So with that clarified, let's go down to the patterns. Um, the first thing is complex tests. And I think everyone's probably seen at least one in their life. This is an example of what that looks like. Um, I told you these are sometimes pretty complex examples. Um, so this is a common thing in these slides. Left-hand side is going to be the test. The right-hand side is going to be the code under test. And um, you'll see that an example here um, of a lot of signs that sort of help you understand whether this test is complex or not. So sort of my definition, I'm looking at this, I see that for one thing, there's a lot of setup code, right? This particular unit test is trying to test that when I have you know, multiple copies of a document owned by different users. When I merge them together, I'm notifying some sort of system that um, a merge occurred. So um, really, the only lines that matter as far as validating functionality is those four on the bottom. Right, update document and just make sure that was called with something. 
but you'll see that there's roughly seven or eight lines of code right above that that you know, are just dedicated to setting up the state necessary to test your functionality. Um, you'll see this happen a lot. You'll also see that there's a lot of fixtures that get created that aren't directly related to the code you're trying to test. Right? Um, for example, users don't really matter in this situation. I just want to see if documents get merged and whether they get notified or not. But regardless, because of the way that the code is actually written on the right-hand side, I still need those users. Um, you also find that you might patch a bunch of methods that have nothing to do with the code you're trying to test. So patching lib.notify, because that's what I'm trying to verify in that call, um, is appropriate. But lib.log really has nothing to do with it. Um, you'll see that notify is actually, you know, we verify functionality in notify with that notify.assert called with at the bottom. Um, but that log, we're really just doing that so we don't end up with some weird side effect like writing to a file somewhere, right? Um, and you'll find this happens often in complex code as well. So we saw a lot of uh, code that looked like this and tests that looked like that. And the major conclusion that we came to is really this test is written that way because the code is written that way, right? Large um, bunches of code lead to large tests, so small bunches of code lead to small tests. Um, so what we did is we actually took a look at that code. We started using a bunch of the methods that you might find in like common refactoring terminology, like extract method. We extracted the functionality out that, functionality out that we really wanted to test. And after that, you'll see that the test code kind of gets a lot simpler with that, right? If I just want to test the notification workflow, I really only need a few things. I need the copies of the document. I just want to merge them together. And then I just want to make sure that lib.notify was called. Um, and you'll see here on the left-hand side, a lot of that setup code is gone. Those additional patches are gone. I just have the code I want to test um, and the bare minimum necessary to set, uh, state necessary to set that up to test that code. Um, so we tackled that. Uh, and the next thing we noticed is there's a lot of situations where um, the I.O. is mixed with logic. Um, and a common example looks something like this. Um, so on the right-hand side here, you'll see that there's this method called get private usernames. What that does is that goes in, calls this REST API, gets the data back, does some validation on that API response, um, and then actually modify or works with the data to return back a list of private usernames, um, if there's a sort of private-public user concept. And if, I, if that's all I want to test, right, I really shouldn't see a lot of code aside from that. Um, but what you'll find is here on the left-hand side, that test code, um, there's um, quite a bit more than that, right? Effectively, um, I have to patch the request.get module to even um, get to the point where I can return the data back to uh, get manipulated by that for loop on the right-hand side. I have to mock a bunch of things that are specific to the request.get thing, like raise for status, for example. And then finally, I'm able to get to the point where uh, I'm just validating that, hey, guess what? With these list of users, if it says private, if the private flag is true, then only return you know, the users that match that. Um, so we saw this a lot. Um, and it doesn't look that bad with a single example. But you could imagine that if a lot of your code is written that way, you're going to end up with a lot of the same boilerplate over and over again. right? You're going to patch that request.get again. You're going to do that mock request JSON. You're going to do that raise for status. Um, because it's just that's the bare minimum you need to do to even validate sort of the business logic that you're looking for. So solution to that, just isolate the IO. Right. Um, once again, it's this concept of kind of taking the functionality that you don't really care about, that you don't want to test, take that complexity, especially around sort of APIs and validating those, and move them into a separate method. Um, and what that allows you to do is basically test that business logic a lot more quickly, and it makes it a lot easier to understand too, right? If I want to just figure out how you're working with that JSON response, I should be testing that by passing in sort of the JSON object or a dictionary and getting back the result. Um, it's a lot easier to read from a tester's, um, from a developer's perspective, and it minimizes the amount of boilerplate you have to put in every single business logic that does some sort of API request. Um, so that's one of the first things we did. Uh, the next thing we found is that it's very common that you'll have to mock several of the same methods um, around a certain feature area. So for example, if you have an API to interact with users, you pretty much want to mock all of the APIs right, that interact with users. Um, so we started gathering these um, similar I.O. features uh, and putting them into what we call clients. Um, so this is a pattern that's existed a long time in the realm of programming. Uh, it's called data access object um, in sort of more traditional terminology. But basically, it's this idea that you can significantly reduce the amount of code that 
um, you have to test over and over again if you integrate into these single clients around these feature areas. And what's great about that is if I want to mock all of the functionality around the user, um, I just mock that one client object and I pass that in instead of um, mocking every single request individually. Um, so by doing that, keeping those two pieces separate, we found that we significantly reduced a lot of the boilerplate around the unit tests themselves. Um, next problem we found is uh, a lot of stateful functions. Um, so I think an example is probably the best way to kind of showcase this. But you'll see that on the right-hand side, we kind of have this function called set permissions. You could imagine that if a user has a few roles that they belong in and the roles relate to permissions, you want to make sure that your user also has those permissions as well. So that's what that method on the right-hand side is doing. And you'll see on the left-hand side, um, there's some code there, or there's some set of code that really doesn't have a lot to do with permissions at all. So for example, if I want to make a user object, let's say that my user always needs a sort of form to be associated with, I have to create that forum object for the user object to actually work at all. Um, and that's another example of the setup code that has nothing to do with the behavior I'm trying to test, right? Um, so I end up having to pay for a lot of cost around this instantiating this user object, passing in a bunch of data that I don't even use um, to just validate the fact that the permissions are merged properly. So an example of a stateful function is something that effectively takes in objects and modifies them and then doesn't really return a lot of data back out there. It's not always the best to unit test that because you end up, well, it's good to unit test it, but it's not a great pattern from a testability perspective because you have to pass in the data and then you have to make sure that afterwards validate the sort of data that, you know, on the object itself. Uh, what we found is we, get, we took a lot of these stateful functions and moved that over to stateless functions. So, if a, you know what a stateful function is, you probably have a good, pretty good idea of what a stateless function looks like. A stateless function has no manipulation of the data whatsoever. Instead, what it does is it takes in the data that you're looking for, runs some sort of logical calculation on that, and returns it back. So you'll see in this case that uh, I got rid of a lot of the boilerplate around creating that forum object that you know, I have no idea how that was related to permissions at all. Same thing with the user's object. And instead, what I'm doing is I'm just passing in a list or a set of the roles that my user is in and getting that data back. From a, unit, from a testability perspective and sort of being able to look at that, it's a lot cleaner. I, as a developer reading this code, don't have to think about what, what is this user object for as far as permissions is concerned? What is the forum object for? Instead, I look at the code, I know exactly what's testing, and I have a pretty good idea uh, that it's not really doing any manipulation of the data underneath. So, that's, so you'll notice that a lot of that kind of had to do with the application code itself. Um, and that's a common pattern. Good tests come from good code uh, or well-testable code. Uh, but one of the problems we found is a lot of our mocks were very brittle. And uh, to get into the definition of some examples a little bit, here's what a mock looks like. Specifically, the behavior that you'll see around brittle mocks is whenever you change some sort of piece of behavior, you add behavior, uh, a bunch of tests and a bunch of your mocks break at the same time. This particular example works. If I have some sort of test object and I have a, and I have a suite, it's a relationship of multiple tests belong to a single suite, and I want to test that delete logic, I can go in here. I, my setup function creates a fixture for both the suite and the test, and I mock out some methods, and then basically I just see if things get called properly. So this works okay, but I guess what, what makes this brittle? Uh, and Really, it comes around to what happens if you want to add functionality. So let's say that uh, there's multiple users interacting with, with these suites, and I want to add permissions on a per test basis. Then my code kind of looks like this. So at this point, uh, whenever I get a test back, I have this completely new field called permission ID that my mock uh, or my fixture didn't even know about. Right? Going back to that example, these fixtures are really minimal. Most likely, they provide a partial um, list of all the data you need to actually create a fully featured suite or test object. Uh, and as soon as I add functionality there, it becomes a problem. So as soon as I put this in here, this delete test functionality breaks, and so does everything else that has to, that assumes that that permission ID exists in that test object as well. So we took a look at this, and really these mocks are brittle because the construction of the object itself is completely separate from the application. And we found that the best way to solve that 
is to use fixtures that are as real as possible. And the way we do that uh, is by actually using application code. So this sounds weird, but effectively this is kind of what, we, what things look like now if we um, start from scratch. We actually import functionality. There should be an import create test in there. But we import functionality uh, directly from the application itself, and we use that same functionality that people use in production uh, or when the application actually runs, and we use that to create the test fixtures as well. And what we found is um, any brittle aspects around the mocks whatsoever or the fixtures, that was completely eliminated by using this method. Uh, because, you know, logically it makes sense, right? If create suite has broken, then my application is just completely broken anyway. Um, so, I sh so I should be able to rely on the same functions that the application is using, um, as long as that's not the one I'm actually trying to unit test. So in an ecosystem where you have, where all the functions in your application are well tested, you should be able to rely on them in your other unit tests as well. And that, you know, is, goes along the path of don't repeat yourself, right? You're reusing the actual application code because you've already written it, you've already tested it, you know it works, and you know it's going to work. Um, so uh, observant people would probably note that I'm actually, you know, there's this create DB function here. And you might ask, uh, is this actually creating a real database? Because I'm pretty sure that when my application runs, I have to create a database um, or something to interact with. And uh, the answer is yes, we do. Um, we actually do create a real database when we execute this stuff. And I know that this is a controversial topic, so uh, I wanted to kind of enumerate our thought process as we tackled this. So let's run through the cons first. Um, commonly you'll hear, what, you're interacting with the database, um, that's really not a unit test anymore. That's an integration test. That's you know, a full stack test. Uh, and I think the perspective we had on that is, you know, labels don't, uh, it's not about labels, it's about what the value, you know, it's about actually accomplishing the functionality that you're, you want to, right? So it doesn't really matter what it's called, if it's testing things and it's validating them, then uh, there's a lot of value there. The other aspect is slow. Um, there's, you know, it's going to be slower because you basically have to pay this cost of actually mod talking to your database to create and delete these objects. Uh, we found that, you know, anecdotally, that's true. Um, you're, it's definitely probably the most overhead we have in our unit tests right now. Um, and you'll see a significant cost depending on things. You can do stuff like reuse the database, right, in between unit tests, um, and that tends to help a bit, but it does, there is a significant cost on that one. Uh, the last part is kind of administrative overhead, right? You have to do this work of actually creating a database every single time you run your unit test and tearing them down. Uh, in our observation, we found that there's a lot of technology out there that makes this really easy. Um, one example is uh, Docker, right? There's this Docker container technology that lets you bring up um, a database, tear it down pretty much extremely easily just with a few command line uh, commands, and that tends to work pretty well. So let's look at the pros that we kind of trade off for that, right? We're taking slow, we're taking a little bit of administrative overhead. Uh, what we gain from that is the reduction in fixture management. Uh, we found that we basically don't have any cost around maintaining these fixtures anymore because they're using these live applications. And we also found that there's an additional benefit that we didn't really think about where we're actually testing the full path to the database as well. A lot of the issues that we caught um, by sort of bringing the application up locally and, and poking and prodding, we can catch that through our unit test framework now because you're actually testing the full stack. So we found that there's a lot of fewer issues in sort of deploying our infrastructure or serv our web services out to a test environment, and having to roll that back because of some database thing that we missed, or a lot of sort of manual poking and prodding locally to actually make that happen. Um, the unit tests tend to catch it. So we've looked at those trade-offs and we decided that um, you know, the developer cost is expensive, uh, machine cost is cheap, so um, we're moving forward with that. The final problem is around sort of fixture management in general. So if you assume that we kind of have these robust fixtures, there's a, still this problem of sort of which fixtures do I need for which tests. And there's a lot of strategies to deal with that, and we've run through kind of the gamut of those. The first example is if you take the Python unit testing module kind of at, at point blank and say, I'm going to unit test like this, you end up with something like this, right? The unit testing pattern kind of goes through this path of setting up the test fixtures through a setup call, 
executing the test using, you know, that tends to be prefix with the test underscore, and then the teardown logic actually removing those fixtures at the end. We had this all over the place. Uh, it works fine, uh, but we found that one of the major disadvantages is the repetition. So every single time we go in here, uh, or every single time we have you know, multiple unit tests that depend on different fixtures, we found ourselves having to rewrite this setup and teardown logic around that particular fixture. So we don't get a lot of reuse without using some other strategy around the creation and teardown of these fixtures. So the next thing we tried was taking advantage of sort of object-oriented subclassing. With that, you have a base fixture that you know, creates your fixtures that you want, and maybe you extend that class and you do your own thing on top of that. This worked okay. We can certainly reuse the fixtures, but it still includes some administrative overhead around that. Specifically, we found ourselves in every single child class, we have to make sure to call that super setup, um, the super classes teardown, and make sure that that's done in the right order, or we find our, cell, our unit tests breaking and our fixtures not cleaning up properly. The other aspect is that uh, single and Python does support multiple inheritance. You can, in, it can inherit from multiple base classes, but that doesn't, it's not a seamless thing. You can't just call other super classes without a significant amount of effort. So sharing sort of split fix, sharing multiple base classes and the fixtures inside of them turned out to be pretty cumbersome. So the final thing we tried uh, is one base class to rule them all. So this literally takes everything that you could possibly want, creates them all in the setup method, and then in the teardown, it tears them all down. So this works, but we found that one, it was extremely slow. And keep in mind that at this point, we've adopted the database fixture pattern, so creating all database objects every single time, even though you don't use them, is very wasteful. And we also found that there's a lot of management around sort of the ordering of this fixture setup teardown. Right? One of the things you have to remember is if you're setting things up, if you're tearing them down, you have to reverse that order. And if you want to inject something in there and you don't have a good understanding of kind of what that relationship of that fixture is to the other ones, you end up putting it in the wrong place, having to sort of guess and check, look through the code, and finally figure out the right place to insert that fixture. So we've learned a lot about fixtures. Um, they're sort of really tough to manage because there wasn't a good pattern in the existing technology to choose the fixtures you needed for each test. And also, the setup teardown stuff is, isn't very fun to work with at all. So we looked for something that kind of did this automatically, right? Uh, really, we want a world where I have a test. This test declares the fixtures it needs. And from that point, there's a completely separate system that looks at that, says, oh, you need fixture A, B, and C. I totally know how to set those up, put them in the right order, and I know how to tear them out afterwards. In this particular situation, what we wanted is magic. Sometimes you don't want magic, but this time, uh, I think you definitely do. I don't want to deal with that. You know, I love problem solving, but I'll do that with board games uh, <laughs> and not with crazy fixtures. So um, there's a concept called dependency injection that effectively does this. And there is a specific test framework that implements this concept of dependency injection, um, and that's PyTest. You should be clapping. This, it's, it is amazing. Like, before I realized PyTest existed, and I was pretty late to the party, I, I was paying real pain with these fixtures. Like, I was playing this game on a daily basis. And PyTest with the concept of dependency injection really makes this magic. So just to walk through an example, you have this function, test add permission. Test add permission takes in a user and permission object, and you can read that by looking at the arguments that are being passed in. PyTest will read that method signature and say, OK, you want a fixture that's named user, and you want a fixture that's named permission. Let me go through my database of fixtures and create those for you. So it goes through its database. It sees that you actually have fixtures called permission and user, which you can declare with a method and basically annotating that with an app pytest.fixture method. And it even does something even greater on top of that. It goes into that fixture and sees if you need other fixtures associated with that and then creates that, those fixtures for you. Right? It's, it's really doing some cool stuff under the hood to make all this work. So it goes through, it traverses this giant tree of dependencies, figures out the right order to create them, creates them all, only the ones that you need, passes them into the function, lets you run the function, and once it's done, it goes back and knows exactly how to tear them all back down. Um, you'll see that specifically the way that I sort of represent that setup teardown function that you saw previously is by having my fixture be a Python generator with that yield statement, 
having a setup code beforehand and having the teardown code afterwards. And it knows how to order all of that properly. So that's fixture management. Basically just use PyTest. <laughs> so here's a summary. Uh, this is basically, how do you keep tests simple? Well, the smells on the left, sort of the solutions on the right. Large complex unit tests comes from large code. Keep your, test, keep your code small and you'll keep your test small as well. If you find yourself doing a lot of like weird I.O. manipulation all over the place, try to find ways to isolate and reuse that I.O., get that complexity out of every single unit test and just keep the business logic tight. If you find yourself doing tons of setup all over the place, you're probably doing so because you have a lot of these stateful functions that need a bunch of other random information. If you move to a situation where you have functions that just calculate and return data back, your unit test will get a lot simpler as well. If you find yourself dealing with a lot of weird mocks that break all the time, most likely your mocks aren't using code that is robust and tested. If you use real fixtures, and by real fixtures I'm saying actually use your application code to create those, I, I guarantee you your problems will be significantly reduced. And last but not least, fixture management, so this already, PyTest, just end of story. Right, that's it. Thanks.